You think they'll do it? <laughs> we should do an outtake, <coughs> an outtake series for Addiction God a Minute. Oh man, I'm telling you. All right, let's start. Ah. Uh. <laughs> oh, good, man. Go. Don't look at me like that. Don't you look at me like Don't that. Don't you look at me like that. All right. Okay, I'm glad we didn't cover that subject. Hey, good morning and welcome to another edition of Addiction. Got a minute? I'm Howie Marlin, and that, unfortunately, is my uh, cohort and brother at arms, Michael Blanchard. I good missed morning. you. That's why I hugged you. I miss you, too. We've been both away on airplanes down warmer climbs, I think. Yeah, right? I went yeah. to, to New Orleans. I yeah. went to New Orleans. Where, where did you go? I was in Tampa, in Atlanta. And uh, I saw my dad and went back to my old rehab location, which was pretty cool. You were Atlanta during yeah. the Super Bowl? Yeah. I got over. It was, we ended up heading down, had no idea that the hotel rates went from $99 <laughs> to $400. But luckily, the, the, my old rehab had reserved rooms at the old price. It was pretty cool. Went to suit the Millenni uh, Millennium Park. And, and saw all kinds of stuff and took pictures, and it was really cool. That's awesome. You know, the Uber rate went, went through the too. roof, too, I'm sure. Well, there's like 18000 a ticket. I, Is that what it was? Yeah, it, it got, if you wanted to get anywhere near where you could see people, it was like anywhere between fifteen to 20000 a ticket. It was insane. Well, I got to tell you, so. I uh, ended up, I wanted a day early just to acclimate myself. My father went to Tulane, so I wanted to give myself a chance to uh, see a bit of the town, but I also went to Bourbon Street. Mm -hmm. And there I am in my New England Patriots sweater. And I was high-fived left and right. It was funny because the people from New Orleans, as broken-hearted as they were about that horrible play, yeah. they only wanted to see the Rams get their ass kicked. It's good. Yeah, so uh, uh, we, we did it. And the strange thing was the training. The training, I went to training for a rise, a, a discipline, or a, a, a style of intervention. And the training was on the same time as the Super Bowl. So I patiently put up with that, with the exception of my phone showing me the score as we went along. And we finished in time for me to get back to the hotel in time for the third, for the fourth quarter. That's all you needed to see. And, yeah. and it yeah. was great. We had yeah. quite a crowd and it was really a lot of fun. But that has nothing to do with what we're doing today. The reason for your trip and the reason for mine. So please let me hand it off to you and tell me about your, um, your revisit, your alumni trip. Yeah. And, and I'll add one more thing with the Super Bowl. Atlanta as a city has PTSD. Because, and the only time I felt more scared wearing a Patriots outfit was, was when I wore a Red Sox outfit at, at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> because they're not too happy about the Patriots down there. You wear, because remember we beat them in the Super Bowl two years ago? They were winning by 20-something points. I do. It is, ooh, it wasn't I do. good. I almost got thrown out. Uh, so I went to Talbot, and I, it was probably one of the most emotional trips I have ever taken. It's been I got sober on July 26, 2010, and it was at Talbot uh, in Atlanta. It's a three-month stay. They have Delta airline pilots and doctors are their primary um, clientele, so it's more of a higher-end rehab. It's expensive. And why it's been eight years since I've gone is beyond me. It, I got there, and Anne-Marie, my significant other, came with me. When I got there, it was like, I, don't, I can't even explain it. I'm, imagine going to Mecca or you going, I don't, going back home. It was almost, I was numb. I got out of the car when I got to the campus, and it's a rundown campus because they're moving to a new one. And I was so thankful that they didn't move before I got there because that's where my memories are is in that rundown place. I would get out of the car, and I just look, and I almost start crying. I take my iPhone, and I take a picture of the building on the outside, and she looks at me like, what are you doing? I'm saying, I can't express to you... I just wanted to drop to my knees and I just want I, I just, it was just such a feeling. And then I said, why has it been eight years since you go back? For 25 bucks, you get to stay for two days and you get inserted right into the, into the groups as an alumni because you're there for two reasons. One, two, so you remember what it was like when you were there for the first time because sometimes you forget how grateful you should be. And then the other thing is, is that you can see the scared looks of all the people. I, I saw one woman who had just been there. She was a third day. She had, almost had constant tears in her eyes. And to be able to reach out to somebody like that and hug them and say, 
I made it, I made it and it's been beautiful since I left. You can make it and, and it's going to be beautiful for you. They look at you and they try to absorb everything they can because you made it to the outside. You made it for a period of time sober and they need somebody to give them a sign of hope that they're going to be able to make it too. And I only had 60 of my Fighting for My Life books left. They were shipped down ahead of time and I stood in front of the whole group and I said, when you go home, there's going to be those moments when you're, you feel alone, you're, at, you're, you're fighting to stay sober, you have depression, you're fighting legal problems or other things with your family because you didn't end up in rehab because you were having a good time. And what I hope is that this book, when it sits next to your bedside or wherever you put it, that there's, there's energy. I put energy in the book <laughs> so that when you are home, and you don't have anything left to get you through, maybe you'll touch that book and that energy will enter your body and you'll stay sober that night. That's what I want for you. And a lot of them started crying and it was just really such a cool thing. It sounds, yeah, it it was sounds cool fantastic. Thing. Yeah, yeah. It is amazing. There's, there are tactile references to soothing imagery. Yeah. And yeah what you've done and one of the reasons why I really enjoy you being part of this discussion is you you have imbued your recovery through your photography mm -hmm. and your the photography the book is a com combination you have the visual yeah, references and, words, and yeah. the meanings yeah. that you find yeah. or other people find behind them which is stated in the texts yeah. of the books but you have uh, not just the visual but you have the physical book itself so as you're looking through it it's associated with the images yeah. so as the book is on the table when you pass by and look at the book there will be a micro spark of memory <laughs> of certain images same thing as I do uh, in therapy with folks I do guided imagery to that yeah. state and yeah. that's what you're doing yeah. with that well, which is wonderful and um, we'll, I, we will get right back to you a little more about your experience uh, as I share, I went down to New Orleans to get an orientation to the Arise uh, style of intervention. For those who are uh, not familiar with various intervention techniques, the more popular ones are based on certain philosophies and uh, whether they be invent invitational, where the person of concern is invited to the very beginning, which is what we prefer or what's referred to as the surprise or confrontational style. And I'm here to offer for anyone who is the least bit interested to contact me to discuss the differences between them and the reason why the, uh, the love first, the family, uh, the uh, arise systems offer for people to be brought in first and the opportunity for them to be part of the, the treatment uh, mm -hmm. assessment and the plan of moving forward. Now what's interesting with Arise is Dr. Judith Landau has taken a very long, very strategic, um, disciplined look at genealogy and the multiple generations of trauma and the way that we have coped. And folks, coping with the stress of being a human through the millennia has resulted in us partaking of all sorts of chemicals in our environment. Mm -hmm. You know about the, uh, the, the American uh, West, Southwestern Indians playing with peyote buttons and m magic mushrooms and things like that as a way to expand the scope of their understanding of life. Um, but we'll talk more th about that as time goes on. So the point of this is it was fantastic being in New Orleans getting this orientation. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, Cara Bradley, who was fantastic in helping get the program going. Um, Megan Musgrades, who was a tremendous help. And of course, Anna Moreno, who was just precious in the understanding of the discipline. So my point being, there are different ways to look at it. Being there are many ways to help people motivate to take action. And let's keep in mind, that's the principle to help people motivate themselves to take action. Yeah. We're only conduits to that. And in the Arise program, I love the fact that it's actually manualized. It's all best practices. All best. You and
basically follow the protocol follow the and let yeah. the family do yeah. the work. By the way, we'll talk about multi-generational trauma in the days to come. Before we go any further, I want to bring up a book that I read called Chasing the Scream, and we'll have a, a little more information about this by Jonathan Harry. I've uh, been reading the book over the last couple of weeks, and it chronicles the beginning of the drug wars in our society back uh, in the very early uh, teens and 20s. And uh, we'll talk more about that later, but I highly recommend it if you haven't uh, known about this book. It gives you a very thorough understanding of the nature of how in the United States we criminalized uh, drug use to the point where we now know how horrible the impact of the cartels, mm -hmm. the, under, the, the, the underworld, and uh, the principles of prohibition, and why the people who best profited from prohibition were the criminals, yeah. and how they wanted that, ed that legislation. So, by the way, if you want to see an uh, organization or a country which has really turned it around, look at Portugal. Oh, and I have to say, Portugal, I saw in a magazine, is one of the top 20 places that you can retire on less than $200,000. I saw that in the paper. <laughs> so you can be drug free. You can have, you, it's like, that's, the, so I'm going to Portugal if that's the place to, go, to be. Yeah. It, I get the feeling the Portugal tourist. It is. Okay, so I belong to the board, all right? Just give me a <laughs> freaking break. But I wanted to say something because the, the, intervent, the intervention piece, so I am only one person, so I can only communicate my one experience. That is, why would I go to Talbot? So interventions happen because people aren't jumping in the boat to go to rehab, right? Right because you wouldn't need an intervention if I could come to you and say, you're gonna have an amazing life-changing experience and you just need to take three months out of your entire lifetime and it's going to transform who you are as a person. You might even be a chief operating officer of a company that's gonna turn into a photographer. You might. You be. might even be happy, whereas your whole life's been miserable. And we know, Mike, that the last thing you wanna do, I wish that that Frickin' plane would crash on the way to Talbot. My sister was on the plane and she looked at me and said, well, thanks for thinking of me because I actually yelled out, I hope this plane crashes. Because I, I don't think there's an intervention in the world that would get me there other than the threat of going to jail for six months to a year and that's why I went. So why am I sitting here almost getting on my knees when I go back eight years later? It's just, it's just that I, I can only be one person's experience, and I know anybody out there that's thinking of going to rehab or is gonna be in an intervention situation, they can say, well, he was different. He drank the Kool-Aid. If you, if you knew me, I would challenge anybody in this world that, to, that I, my opinion and, and outlook at rehab was the worst and life-ending and, uh, why did I, why did I get, almost get on my knees eight years later? It changed, it changed everything for me. And because it's beyond, it goes way beyond the consumption of alcohol or drugs. It goes into who you are as a person. It gives you a chance f to self-reflect. I had to write letters to my mother and to my father and I had to do things that had been deep-seated since I was like 10 years old. It, it, it's, it's hard grinding work if you choose to participate. You can sit there and you can do nothing for the first, for the three months and come out and drink again. It's all, that's the, the inner motivation that's required is that you are gonna do the work to try to get at the things. But if you truly are tired of, of chasing drugs and alcohol, I just, I wish somehow someone could, you know like Mr. Spock could go, the mind meld, and if somebody could, do the Mr. Spock thing, they'd be able to look inside me and say, wow, this is worth giving a chance so that they don't have to drag me but, you know, with a collar down to, to, to rehab or set this whole thing up. So I only say that because if someone's on the fence, you know what, 28 days, th th two months, three months, three months was critical for me. And actually, as I sat there in the room, this woman confided um, down at Talbot. She had been there. She was just approaching her graduation at three months. And in front of this very large group, she sat there and she said, she started crying and she said, I still think I have control over my disease. 
and I'm so scared because I'm going home and it's going to be exactly the same thing. And it's only now that I'm starting to see that maybe I don't have control. And she's crying, felt like a failure, I felt like a loser that she hasn't gotten this in three months. And she broke down completely crying in front of the group. And so I just looked at her and said, well, why are you crying now? Are you, it seems like you're, you're understanding here in this moment. And she says, yes. She says, but I've been here for three months. I wasted all those three months. I said, zero wasted time. There's zero wasted time. You are simply on your journey. Your journey was for you to fight this thing to death for three months, to come in this room with all of these alumni and suddenly something was triggered in you and you broke down crying. You made a major step. If it takes you another three months, it takes you another three months because you've got to get it here because the rest of your life is going to depend on it. You know, so it's, it's, I want to see interventionists put out of business <laughs> because then you could just talk to somebody and say, look, it's good for you. Go. And they say, oh, okay, good. <laughs> That's what we should have. That would be the easy part. <laughs> I'm a licensed clinician. I'd love to just have a clinical practice. <laughs> if, if that wasn't necessary, that would be fantastic. No, I know. And listening and to dream. your understanding of those steps is critical. Um, the most recent research is revealing that it's taking upwards of two years for the mind to return to its pre-drug yeah, involvement state. Yeah. Everyone is so different. Yep. What you said from your heart, whether it take three months or six months or a year, was perfect because everyone's different. Yeah. Why do we say that we are looking for the opportunity for the person of concern to get treatment for a length of time, and we'll talk about six months or a year, why? We don't know how long it will take for that person to round the corner. I have worked with people who on the ferry, leaving the island to take them to treatment, have come to the conclusion that their life needs to turn. They then decided not to go inpatient, but to do intensive outpatient mm -hmm. and have remained sober to this day. When you have made up your mind, it's going to happen. The big question is, when? Have you had enough? When are you ready? And so that's why this we keep that open. But it's fantastic that you went down for that alumni revisit. Yeah. You know, clearly there's just so many components to this and folks truly don't understand. The nature of the chemical system which defines the addictive process boils down to a warm hug. I'm sure you've heard that description. Mm -hmm. The addictive process is the inverse of the trauma. It's the forgetting of the crisis and the pain. It's the warm hug, which people often describe as the feeling when they have either done a bump of fentanyl or heroin or taken a nice big long swig of booze. That's the reason for doing it, to get the dopamine flowing, which is the joy chemical that's normally uh, you know, triggered by the brain itself for things like a warm mother's hug or a, a loving embrace and things like that. And because of trauma and pain, because of situational crisis, we want to relieve ourselves of that. Yeah. And when we do relieve, we get that warm hug. Who doesn't want that warm hug? And, and, it's, and I think we were talking about it before the show that there was, a, there was a physician who spoke, and I've heard this. I, got, I have my master's in psychology. I've heard this a thousand times. And I understand the chemical processes that take place that drive addiction. But for some reason, what he said really connected with me. And that is, that is that that primitive part in your brain that was originally the dominant part in your brain, which, which gives pleasure uh, when you do the right thing. So I drink water. I feel pleasure. It's a good thing. If I don't have that pleasure, I may not drink water and I'll die. So it was all tied to what you had to have to sustain life, right? Mm -hmm. I got to go eat food. So if I'm dying of thirst and I'm a caveman and there's like 700 Tyrannosaurus Rexes sitting out there between me and the pool, but I know I'm going down, I'm going to go through whatever I need to to get to that water. It is that kind of a primitive need to get that pleasure of the consumption of the water because it's correlated to sustaining life. And it's done without forethought. It without forethought, that's right. It was originally kind of just sitting in there. As we grew the prefrontal cortex and the cortex over that little primitive part, somebody forgot to put the connections in. 
We can't force it to do what it doesn't want to do. It sits there as this primitive thing that drives you to the point where you'll risk being eaten by dinosaurs. It's often referred to as the lizard brain. The lizard brain. So, so if you know, so and as an alcoholic, I need to understand this so that I don't think it's because I'm a poor character, because I don't have discipline, I don't have will, I'm just a bad person. It's important for me to understand that my little thing inside my head is now turned on by a drug or an alcohol which amps up the dopamine millions of times more than what the water would have done. And what it does is it wants that primitive thing doesn't know any better. It says, I need more and more and more and more and therefore I'm gonna drive you to do just insane things in order to keep it there. Just like walking through those dinosaurs. I'm gonna drive you to do insane things like get arrested three times for drunk driving in, in three months. I'm gonna push you. Now, that doesn't say that once you recognize that, you don't have the responsibility because there are ways to control and to move forward through taking the, the material away by sobriety and so on and getting out of isolation, all those tools will get you this. So you have a responsibility to recognize you have that disease, but now it's not a character flaw, it's a disease, and now I'm responsible for getting better. And it just, I don't know what it was, it just really clicked with me, that power of that drive, and that's why people will sit there, we've had some deaths here, with a needle in their arm dead in the car, because that drive to seek that relief will bring you to death. And, um, it's, it, it just was a powerful way to think about what we face uh, if you have that genetic uh, component, which is a significant component, that your brain turns on like a gas on a flame, whereas somebody else's might not, you know. That all right, so that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I doubt that. Yes, sir. But you hit the nail on the head repeatedly about certain elements of this process. And I really do hope that uh, folks that the, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and whatever else we're doing will soon be available on the, the, the more popular um, new media sites for information. Uh, we'll be working on providing short clips of clear definitions of terms, treatments, different modalities, facilities. So the idea is for you to be able to go to our site and get some guidance to start the process. It's not important which style of help you get. It's important to get the help. Because if in your heart you have found that it's time to help your loved one, if you have found it's time for you to get help, then we would like to be part of the wave of clarity, the wave of sanity, to help turn the tide of this horrific scourge now, we don't have too much time, but I'd like very much for you to shout out to the folks who were important to you in your trip down south. Yeah, the, the people at Talbot, it, there's it, quite eight years is a long time and there's a lot of turnover, but the key people in my life, Angie B, Angie Branch, and Ben Wilson, people who were there, it would meant so much to have them still there and to have the inspiration of people who donate and give their lives to the patients that are there. It was really incredible. And I want to thank my Anne Marie for going with me and she participated in the couples groups and all the other activities and it was really, it was really a wonderful trip and um, um, I'm not waiting eight years for the next one. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. What, we will list the, uh, the website at the end of the show, but do you happen to know it off the top Yeah, of Talbot name? Recovery Campus in Atlanta. I think it's talbotrecoverycampus.com. But just Google Talbot Recovery Campus. They're moving into a brand new facility. It's incredible compared to the old beat up one that I love so much. I might go back there by myself from now on and just forget and go because I like it there. But they're going to be, it's going to be an incredible thing. If people want to get, um, anybody can go. They have a young adult program. It is more expensive, but it's a unique model. I know we're almost out of time, but the model depends on treatment in the facility, but also you live freely in apartment complex. And there are rules and you're out in society. You're not just... It's the mo I think 75% of the healing takes place in the brotherhood of people back in the apartments, facilitated by the treatment in the facility. It is a unique model that is less shocking when you go home than when you're let out the door from the rehab and you're out back into the world. You've been in the world all along when you're in this model. And um, it's, it's unique. So I'd be happy to talk with anybody that has an interest 
in, uh, in trying to send a, either a young adult or, uh, or, or anyone there. I'd be glad to help. It's wonderful that you want, this would be referred to as an intensive outpatient program, an IOP? I guess so, but it would be, it, but you live there. You, you, part of your room, you have room and board tuition, so I, what do you call that? I mean, if, I guess if you were all stuck in one building, doesn't matter. To be a part of it, you have to live in the residences. You have to submit to drug testing. The residence is searched on a regular basis. You have rules about having to travel in packs of three. You can't go anywhere by yourself. It, I, it's priced like it's an inpatient because you you can't just come in from your home. You have to uproot. You have to be in that facility and abide by all those rules. However, it sounds like an intensive outpatient program. Uh, the, it's an open door policy. You are free to leave. You go yes, with. Yes, you, you can go take with, off at any uh, moment. With, had a very somber reason for returning home quickly, and I'm in the airplane realizing, the the more I know, the less I know. Yeah, and I'm just. I am just consumed with the, the feelings of wanting to hurry up and learn because uh, at 64, I have uh, more years behind me than ahead of me and hopefully I'll be able to provide whatever time I have left on this planet constructively. Uh, what I would like to do is leave in my wake a, a better environment, a better place for our children. I say a little piece at the end of the show that reflects that. But the bottom line is that's why Michael and I do this and I hope that you're able to be patient with us as we upgrade the quality of our production, the um, websites and the uh, new media sites. Please do send us your suggestions, your criticisms, and your ideas. Folks that you know that you think would be nice to have on the show and ideas about the format. I want to shout out to Judith Landau, a remarkable individual who certainly came up with a different way to look at the family and generational trauma and use that as the cornerstone of helping motivate individuals to change and in the wake leave the family in a healthier place. And you can find them at uh, arise-network.com and I'll put that at the uh, end of the show as well. I also want to thank Imagine Recovery. Uh, really, uh, Chris O'Shea and Felicia uh, Klempeter, Klempeter, who are wonderful hosts and have a fantastic IOP in New Orleans. So I went from Bourbon Street, watching the shindigs there and seeing how silly people can be to being with folks who are helping those who don't have control with it. It was, uh, the dichotomy was startling, but to get to know uh, Chris and Felicia even a little bit was wonderful. I want to thank um, St. Christopher's Addiction Wellness Center, uh, Brandy uh, Klingman. Of course, uh, Cumberland Heights, Stacy Bridges, hi Stacy, and Capstone Treatment Center, uh, Ruth Ann Rigby, thank you very much. Um, and of course, Robin Mooney, from guess where? The Jay Flowers Institute in Houston. It's true. I interviewed Dr. Flowers a, f a month ago with absolutely no idea that a month later I would be at a training where their organization was sponsoring the training. Mm, cool. So it, it's a little God wink there, a little bit of kismet. So that brings us to the end of our allotted time. Um, Michael, is there anybody you want to say uh, goodbye to before we... No. Get... I just want to say that I want you to think about PTG for this week, post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth? That's the, that's the word I want people to Google for the week, PTG. This PTSD, more people suffer from PTG than PTSD. After they go through trauma, they grow in ways that they could have never and never have done otherwise. I leave you with that brilliance. And so have the Eagles, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> every, every country song you ever heard. <laughs> Out of trauma comes creativity. It well, does. thank you. Thank you very yes. much. So on behalf of Michael Blanchard, I'm Howie Marlin. February 8th, 2019. This brings us to the end of another edition of Addiction. Get a minute. We'll see you next time. Got a minute. <laughs> Got a minute, not get a minute. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Are you guys still there? Wait, wait, take take two. <laughs> Folks, on behalf of Michael Blanchard and Howie Marlin, uh, this is uh, February 8th, 2019. This brings us to the end of another edition of Addiction. Got a, Got minute? a minute? All right. Cool. We'll see you next time. I think they fell asleep in there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you turn it on? I can't do this anymore. I can't. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> we'll get a replacement. <laughs> if we all drip one drop of sanity back into the bucket of our society, we just might end up filling the pool enough to give the next generation a little safer world. I've got a saying that describes my efforts. The best I can do is the best I can do, and I will. This brings us to the end of another edition of Addiction. Got a minute? I wish you warm breezes and clear sailing.